We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all united. Police from the Netherlands and from wherever you are in the world, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Uh, and welcome to the session Fan the Flames, Regulating Competition in Digital Markets, which is organized by the Internet Society Youth Special Interest Group, the Youth Observatory. Today we're going to discuss the regulation of competition in digital markets. Anti-competitive practices are not a new issue, but as internet-related market boomed, the extent of such monopolistic practices changed and shifted to digital platforms. This led to a need for a sophisticated approach to regulating internet-related markets. This has led to different emerging regulations all over the world. For example, the Media Bargaining Code in Australia and the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act in the European Union. This kind of regulation does not only impact large tech companies as they are intended to, but also small enterprises. This leads to both positive and negative impacts. Furthermore, the multi-stakeholder approach seems to be overlooked when regulation is established. While we notice more often in the field of internet governance, uh, that this approach is very useful when taking action. These are two main subjects that our speakers will discuss today. And the note for the attendees, uh, just as Elliot already just sent in the chat, feel free to ask questions throughout the whole session in the Zoom chat. Me and my co-moderator Elliot Mann will keep an eye on the chat and make sure that these questions are passed on to our speakers during the discussion. So who are our speakers today? First of all, we have Veronica, who is uh, there on site. Uh, please give a little wave, Veronica. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Um, and she is a lawyer currently pursuing her PhD in competition law at Cafuscari University of Venice. Her research mainly focuses on digital monopolies and how the dominance of a few internet corporations distorts the competitive dynamics globally and curbs consumer rights. Veronica has been active in the internet governance ecosystem since 2019. In 2020, she was selected as the Internet Society IGF Youth Ambassador, and subsequently, she was part of the 2021 cohorts of the YouthIC and the NextGen and ICANN programs. Currently, currently Veronica is co-founder and vice president for research at the Dear Governments Organization, a youth-led intervention which carries out the impact assessment of national and regional internet-related regulations and advocate for an open, trusted, and non-manipulable internet. And I would definitely uh, recommend checking out that organization because it's doing amazing things. And I think we can expect much more amazing things of it in the future. Uh, secondly, uh, also on site, we have Cherry Nathaniel Copia, who is the young Burkina Bay entrepreneur working in the digital and social sectors. He's currently the country director of the NGO Maximianza IT Solution, whose main objective is to create opportunities for career development for young Africans through information and communication technologies. Since 2016, he has created an agency for the development of digital solutions and coaching in digital entrepreneurship called D DigiClink. He is also the inventor of the S mask, a smart mask connected for self health control, fighting COVID 19 and other similar viral contamination. Then, third, we have uh, Paula Galvez Carigalas, who is a Peruvian attorney with more than five years of experience advising government entities, major technology companies, and civil society organizations in the drafting of public policies relating to emerging technologies, digital economy, privacy, and cybersecurity. She's currently a strategic advisor on digital regulation in the Digital Government Secretariat of the Presidency of the Council of Ministers of Peru and leads the design of the National Digital Talent Strategy. Previously, she has been the regulatory and public affairs leader at Neobox and uh, an attorney at Microsoft. Paula is a board member of the Internet Society Youth Observatory, former UN IGF Youth Ambassador and Open Internet Leader 2020-2021. And last but definitely not least is Rashi Saxena, who is a telecommunication engineer by training based out of Bangalore, India. 
She is currently building HateBase, a global AI repository to assist universities and research organizations in moderating online conversations and using hate speech as a predictor for regional offline violence for the Sentinel project. Working with Eye for Policy, Rashi is supporting policymakers with practical guidance on designing inclusive policy co-creation processes for multi-stakeholder participation for AI policy. Rashi serves in a number of advisory roles, such as the Intimate Rights and Principles Dynamic Coalition and Mission Public's We the Internet Project. She has contributed to consulting projects for DCM, Gapminder Foundation and the IO Foundation and was highlighted as one of the 100 experts in Mozilla's 2020 Internet Health Report. So when I hear about these four wonderful speakers today, I, I have all the trust that it will be an absolutely amazing discussion. I'm very much looking forward to it. And uh, today I will be working together with my great co-moderator, Elliot, and I think it will be a great session. So let's just get started to the discussion where we're first going to discuss uh, the first policy question. How do the ongoing regulations to address the market imbalance created by large tech companies small uh, impact small businesses? Uh, first of all, over to you, Veronica. Uh, could you please tell us a bit about this? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Daphne. Uh, actually, this is one, this policy question, uh, it's one that I was, um, I, I mean, I thought a lot about this policy question and I tried to give an answer, I mean, to shed a light on this policy question from the European perspective and from an academic, with an academic approach. And um, in the European Union, uh, the um, economic structure is predominantly made up of small and medium enterprises. So uh, the commission has recently seized the opportunity to um, start to undertake regulatory initiatives uh, to try to, you know, um, level out uh, the uh, competitiveness of small and medium enterprises in the Europe and has done it um, looking at the role that um, small enterprises um, and the relationship that those small enterprises uh, have with the, uh, the gay firm, with the big tech corporation. And um, it's like, it's, you know, there are main, mainly two, um, there are um, a few regulations um, we have uh, looking at uh, the small and medium enterprises from uh, two perspectives. The one as small enterprises um, as a competitors um, and um, as um, customers of uh, the big the big tech corporation. Um, in the first case, um, it happens. Um, it it happens um, rarely that uh, those uh, small uh, corporations, especially startup, undertake uh, the pathway uh, toward um, tremendous innovation, especially in blockchain area. But it happened that um, those, many of those startups were um, substantially eaten by uh, the big tech corporations and uh, without any assessment, any control by the uh, anti-monopoly uh, authorities. And, and this is because um, uh, in order to assess whether or not the merger or the acquisition is, uh, would um, end up being, um, you know, um, to restrain the competitiveness in Europe, uh, those um, those startups should have like a dimension, um, a substantial dimension, and usually this dimension is measured on annual turnover. But as you may know, uh, small uh, th those kind of startups usually 
have no turnover or don't reach the threshold, the legal threshold to um, notify uh, the acquisition um, to the European, to the anti-monopoly authorities or the commission if the merger, you know, as uh, European, uh, as an European dimension. Um, but uh, I want to share some data with you, uh, data taken by the by a a background notes uh, published last year by the OECD on um, um, killers acquisitions and merger control. And that mentioned some reviews and reports by the Fuhrman of 2019, The Economist and uh, from Lear. And it pointed out that um over the time frame of um 10 years in 10 years the gay farm have acquired have made almost um 400 uh 400 acquisition and um, spending something like 31.6 billion uh us dollars and a few, a very few of them have been um, have been looked into by the uh, you know the the anti anti monopoly uh, authorities, and it's something that it's worrisome, especially um, if you think, as I as I already mentioned, that uh, the European uh, you know the European ma economic market, the um, um, European economic structure is made up of uh, small and medium enterprises, and that the Commission is pushing uh, toward um, toward innovation and digitalization of small enterprises. And but um, there have been proposal in this sense to uh, adjust the criteria for the notification to the to the uh, to the anti-monopoly uh, agencies and authorities. But the problem is that with uh, startups and small enterprises, um, um, there are other hurdles because in assessing whether or not that acquisition could have an impact in, in the next uh, three, four or five years, um, it's, it's quite difficult to find uh, you know, elements that allow um, the competition authority uh, to effectively say that one merger, one acquisition uh, could have a, an anti-competitive effect uh, in the future. And because we also have to look at uh, whether the product and service uh, of that small startup would be successful in the future, uh, whether um, it will go effectively. Uh, and, um, you know, there are other other elements in consideration in this sense. Uh, and when in, when it comes to um, small, um, small businesses as a competitor, usually, uh, sorry, um, as a customers, uh, small firms are um, most of the time also customers of big tech corporation, and um, they are what we call business users. Those they actually pay for the service uh, that, you know, I don't know if you ever heard of the indirect network effect. They actually pay for the service and for, I don't know, targeted advertising. And we get, as end users, we get free service because, you know, we are supposed to be the, the, the target of those personalized services. And in this position, the small uh, businesses are, you know, a subject to uh, an unbalanced bargaining power that tips um, in favor of the gatekeepers. And most of the time they came up single-handedly with um, terms and conditions 
uh, they may favor themselves or deny access to their infrastructure and, and services, determine discriminatory condition. And this uh, um, major bargaining uh, power stem from they, they being um, monopolists in their own ecosystem. And this is the ecosystem is a concept that um, wasn't known in, and I mean, in an antitrust or competition law, because we talk of relevant markets, but now we have to look at the ecosystem. Um, so that, for example, in the operating system, we have iOS and Android, but they do not communicate with each other. So they are not interoperable. And, or if we look at the cloud computing, um, it's it's not possible for um, a business to uh, switch from I don't know Amazon AWS to uh, Microsoft Azure for example or to IBS because there are no common protocol because they are they do not follow the same standard they do not speak the same language so those are basic businesses are basically locked in in one ecosystem without a chance to you know go uh, shift to uh, another you know competitor and in this sense could you, uh, the could you digital please market try act, to wrap it up in the next 30 seconds so we can move on to the next speaker as well okay yes great thank you um, yes, just to say that um, the Digital Market Act addressed this concern that is imposing an exempt obligation. Uh, and yes, just this is my wrap up in this sense. So maybe regulations uh, in Europe, I mean, it's moving toward, uh, you know, um, the, trying to support most businesses in this sense. Great, thank you so much uh, for the clear insights. And I, I really think that, that it becomes clear that a, a lot of work still needs to be done in Europe, even though they are saying that the, they are getting everything together so well. Uh, now I'm very curious to as to what the situation is in, in Africa. So I would like to pass over to Cherry to uh, give his little speech on um, the ongoing regulations in, in Africa and how they affect small and, and medium-sized enterprises. Okay, thank you for the floor. But I will give my um, appreciation in the world, not for Africa only, because uh, it's general, it's the same, it's the same kind of uh, policies, it's the same kind of problem. Uh, Anti-competitive is same in everywhere. So uh, we know that uh, big internet companies are going too powerful. These companies control large market shares and almost everything in their respective sectors. So in the, the increase of their power is in danger to small business on the internet. Their power allow them even to lay down market roles that are, of course, uh, a problem uh, not good for civil of uh, a small business and customers. The adoption of new legislative provisions or the modification of existing ones played an important role in the this anti-competitive practice. Many countries are taking a proactive approach to finding solutions to competition concern in digital markets. To this end, they adopt new legislative provisions, modify existing ones, or clarify and adapt them. This phenomenon can be observed not only in the country, developing country, but also in the certain developing and emerging countries. For example, Germany, China, and Russian Federation have changed their competition laws to adapt them to a new challenge posed by digital markets. These amount loads have given competition authority additional powers, such as the Federal Central Office of Germany, which is now empowered to intervene at a nearly stage. They have drawn up the list of potential anti-competitive practice. 
they have also extend or clarified uh, the scope of the application of competition laws in digital markets. Japan and European Union have developed new legislation for online platforms. Japan has imposed new obligation, including on disclosure of information. In the European Union, digital markets law can be seen as extending or complementing uh, the existing legal regime. It reports on the existence of guardian of markets a platform and prohibit some of their practices, such as giving per, uh, pre, uh, give, as giving a preferential treatment to their products and preventing users from installing pre-installed application or software and provide for sanctions in the event of any infringement. Um, you know, state willingness to regulate online platform is detected not only by competition reason, but also by other reasons such as consumer protection, data protection, and digital industry, industry industrial policy. Uh, in Japan, for example, uh, the law to make digital platform operation more transparent and fair was drafted under the direction of executive branch in collaboration with the Fair Trading Commission, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, and the Ministry of the Interior and Communication. In German, while the public authority preferred to amend the law rather than adopt a new provisions, the amend law, the amend law was drawn up by the Federal Ministry of Economy and Energy. In the consulting, or in the consul consultation with the Federal Office for Intent. In European Union, the development of and implementation of the law on digital markets is the responsibility not only for the European Commission Directorate General in charge of competition, but also the Directorate General uh, Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship, Small and Medium Size Enterprise, and Communication Networks, Content and Technologies. Compare it uh, with regulatory text and guideline, the amended laws grant more power to competition authority and more clearly differentiate between what business parties are acceptable and those which are not, thus offering a guarantee of legal certain for business. However, changing uh, the law takes time and require competition authority to convince the government and legislative bodies of uh, its necessity. Uh, in Germany, for example, uh, the honest is on academia to conduct research and study to establish that the existing law is no longer relevant and therefore need to be changed. As for the new provision adopted, some of those developed as a precautionary measure for digital platform are still based on the self-regulation. In Japan, for example, the law to make digital platform operation more transparent and fairer require platform to carry out self-assessment uh, rather than punishing certain business practices under the idea that its provision should be applied according to standards. Uh, in uh, terms on that, the, uh, the platform will themselves uh, be agreed. Uh, that is my point of view according um, this question. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your insight and, and especially having the worldwide view. I think that's very useful. Um, before we go on to the second policy question and start discussing that, I think it's a good moment to see if there are any questions. Elliot, do you want to take over? Sure. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, I know if you're in Katowice, um, there's a microphone going around there. Otherwise, um, feel free to put your hand up in the Zoom room or put a message in chat as well. If not, I have a couple of questions. Um, <laughs> uh, 
Veronica, um, you mentioned you're, we're still speaking in terms of relevant market and other, you know, old fashioned competition law terms. Do you think that the fact that those terms that we traditionally use to um, talk about competition law, you know, they don't apply to our new digital age? Do we need to do more than just amending our current competition laws? Do we need to take kind of a ground level approach to this entire issue? Uh, Elliot, thanks for the question. Actually, it's what the European Union is doing, uh, you know, because they know uh, they are mending competition law. They're actually, um, there has been a, an open consultation about the new competition tool, and they didn't come up with a proposal uh, still, but uh, it was due in the second half of 2020, and we don't have, um, you know, the draft. Um, so we do not know how, um, in which direction, uh, which direction they took in this sense. But we have the Digital Market Act. Um, the compromise uh, draft was published, I think, three weeks ago, and. Um, uh, and they have certainly considered the fact that digital market, should we call it that way, uh, digital ecosystem are different, are, have a dif different structure. So we are starting to acknowledge the fact that um, the competition law was conceived for traditional market. They have a certain structure, but that sometime that in some sense don't always apply to um, the, the digital ecosystems because of, uh, you know, uh, technical barrier also and economic barriers. So yes, we can, um, there is a lot of discussions going on these days. Do we have time for one more question? Do we? <laughs> yeah, let's go for one more question and then go on so, to the second policy question. So, so Nathan, um, I know um, you There discussed... is a question here in the oh, room. Is it? Oh, fantastic. Let's go to that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Hi, Corey Doctor from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Thank you for your remarks about the Digital Markets Act. I wanted to ask you to maybe contrast them with other regulations such as the Digital Services Act and the Copyright Directive, the Terror Directive and so on, where we see that firms are really being required to be a certain size in order to function in Europe. In fact, they have to be as big as giant American tech companies <laughs> in order to function in Europe. And, and how do you think we can resolve the tension between the, the desire to take these offshore companies that have created harms and make them behave themselves and take these offshore companies that have created these harms and make them irrelevant. Thank you. Um, I, this is a question for me, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I followed most the um, Digital Market Act, but I've read uh, the Digital Services Act. And I know that in the Digital Services Act, there is a discussion about. Um, prohibiting uh, the targeted uh, targeted advertising. And yes, in this sense, there are some European parliamentarians. Uh, it's something that uh, as particularly interested, uh, um, I'm particularly interested in that aspect of contrast between the Digital Markets Act and the Digital Services Act because some European parliamentarians have uh, advanced uh, this proposal to um, prohibit the, the targeted advertising. And I think that um, I want to be too harsh in this, but I think it's preposterous at this moment to forbid the kind of uh, advertising because you can talk of enhancing transparency, yes, but to, to basically uh, remove the model because, the, because digital markets or the digital economic economy is based on personalized 
and targeted services. So you, if you want to ban the targeted advertising, you are basically um, selling that you do not want to have the kind of economy or economy based on uh, that because we couldn't have free um, free application or free services without someone paying for uh, um, someone else, your business user paying for um, for personalized services and targeted advertising at this point, because it would be uh, it wouldn't be uh, attractive uh, as a as a model. I know I haven't answered your question. But yeah, this is what came to my mind in this in this moment. Perfect, and I, I think there will definitely be more room uh, for discussion on this topic during uh, the, the Q&A part we will do at the end. Uh, but first we'll go on to the second policy question. And uh, for that question, we have Paola speaking. And this question entails, in the example of the side effects of the ongoing regulations on other businesses, what is the best model to predict the consequences of emerging regulations concerning competition on the internet? Paula, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daphne. Um, hello, everyone. And first of all, let me thank the, the session organizers for setting this up. Uh, actually, it's great that we're gathering from very different regions uh, backgrounds as well. So this is an, an exciting and enriching conversation. Well, yes, as um, our colleagues mentioned, digital transformation presents unprecedented opportunities. However, I can see myself that it also brings considerable uncertainty on the evolution of this transformative era. And um, in this question, I am speaking um, as an advisor of the Peruvian government. And for the last months, I've seen how government needs a deeper understanding of the critical challenges that emerging technologies pose uh, to the rulemaking activity. Um, first of all, digitalization blurs uh, the usual delineation of markets and sectors, and it confuses the traditional distinction between consumers and producers, and I think it was previously, previously mentioned. Um, as this is the case with the rise of individual prosumers. Um, this blurring of boundaries affects the scope of the regulator's mandate and activities. So the economic uh, properties of digital business also challenge um, the standard cost-based regulatory models as price formation in the digital economy obeys different rules. And most of the time, local entrepreneurs do not have the financial back to comply with uh, new regulatory mandates. I can see that in Peru. Um, we have many startups, for instance, but um, they complain because they, man they say that when this new bill will come into, into force, uh, they will not be able to comply with it. And it will uh, obligate them to either finish their operations in Peru and go to another country that has more flexible uh, regulations, or uh, just uh, sell the startups to a bigger company. And, and that is not what we want uh, at all. We want really a, an innovation uh, ecosystem in Peru that um, gets better, gets bigger, sorry. Another important challenge that digitalization brings to governments when regulating is the difficulties of regulatory enforcement as it questions the traditional notion of liability. In particular, it makes it more difficult to apportion and attribute responsibility for damage uh, caused by the use of technology to end users, or the difficulty of attributing liability to the vendor or, I don't know, the, the um, equipment manufacturer. Also, um, when AI or another technology is involved, for instance, it's difficult for public officers to enforce this. Uh, moreover, digitalization drastically increases the intensity of cross-border flows, which I see it has a lot of benefits and it gives businesses global reach uh, while being able to locate various stages of the production processes uh, or service centers across different countries. But this feature 
enables companies to avoid compliance when it comes to their physical um, presence and their policy for data protection or other regulated areas, for example. Um, therefore, there is a mismatch between the transboundary nature of digitalization and the fragmentation of regulatory frameworks across jurisdictions. To tackle this challenge, the harmonization of regulatory frameworks is a good option. Um, I, I wouldn't say globally, because we have different circumstances, but I will say at least regional. For instance, in Latin America, um, government, governments were trying uh, to have these conversations to bring a digital agenda and uh, try to harmonize this. The, in this pandemic situation bring um, to the agenda a lot of challenges and now it's, it's one of the main topics of, of our regional discussions. And going back to your question, Daphne, I haven't found the best model yet, uh, but first of all, governments should not rush into regulation as there is a real risk uh, of getting it wrong and particularly affect small and medium businesses. Um, and in some cases, a regulatory approach may not even be the best course of action. What we do at the Secretariat of Digital Transformation in Peru is to reflect on the public policy problem that we aim to solve question and test the approaches that may help achieve the policy objectives uh, because our main goal is to promote digital innovation while preserving digital rights and mitigating the risks. Um, and given the dynamics of the digital transformation, regulatory solutions must be flexible enough to let innovation be developed. Yesterday, I heard this term in a session, future-proof regulations, and actually I really like it because it summarizes very well what we're looking for in the Peruvian government. Technologies go faster than law, and it will happen certainly in, in the future. And we don't want to regulate each new technology. Therefore, constant government monitoring is needed, as well as regulatory impact assessment, and uh, also carry out regular post-implementation reviews. Uh, so that would be um, one, one idea I have, not really the best model um, yet, but I think uh, this is my point of view. I'm happy to discuss this further next. Thank you, Daphne, and everyone for your attention. Perfect. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I think uh, I was thinking about this question as well. And I think it's it's very difficult to find a model. But I, I think what you propose is a great first step. Uh, I think over to Elliot to see if there's maybe one question before we go uh, to the next policy question. Is there any questions in the room? I think let's just move on to the next question and we can have more time at the end. Perfect. I think that's a good idea. And I think uh, we also have some uh, nice overlap with the second policy question, uh, the third policy question, apologies, um, where the question is, what role can the multi stakeholder approach play in the creation of effective regulations on competition? And should this possibly be revised or modified? Um, First of all, we will go to Paola because she unfortunately can't uh, stay until the end of the session. So Paola, take the floor. Thank you, Daphne. And I don't want to monopolize the discussion, so I will be brief. Um, but yeah, what we, what we just mentioned um, has given new impetus to the significance of a multi-stakeholder model of internet governance. And in, in Peru, we are firm believers that the technical management and governance of the internet should not be only under government control. In fact, it is a priority for the Peruvian government to keep supporting and strengthening capacity for all the stakeholders, including industry, academia, civil society, the youth also. So what has happened, and I'm going to share our experience, that we have approved Oh, uh, urgency decree number 006, which creates the digital transformation national system. It is a functional system of the executive branch. And this norm, this law, gives an equal level to each stakeholder, and it allows for community-based policymaking. This law recognizes that all the stakeholders have a valuable contribution to make to internet governance discussions and decision. And it is a proven model for responding to these complex policy and technical challenges. Um, 
what else? We have also the laboratory of digital transformation. It's like an innovation lab of the government. And we have a group of researchers that constantly go and speak with the citizens because they are the ones who are in pain or that they need uh, the, their rights to be preserved. It, before the pandemic, researchers uh, used to travel and go to the rural areas because that is when we have more connectivity gap, uh, digital talent gap. So it's firsthand, um, listened to the, what they have to say. Now uh, that we are under pandemic circumstances, under surveys are held online, uh, which I hope we can resume our our face-to-face -face, um, service. But um, for us, it's fundamental to listen to the citizens and to discuss this. Also, the Peruvian general government policy for the period 2021 to 2026 has included as an axis the digital transformation of the country with equity. It is the first time that this topic has been added uh, to a general government policy. And in my opinion, this is a relevant step to give multi-stakeholder discussions on the digital policy the relevance that they need. Um, for instance, the artificial intelligence national strategy and the digital talent um, strategy that I am uh, co-designing, we are doing it under um, a committee, multi-stakeholder committee that was conformed um, some, I think, three months ago, and we have bi-weekly um, called, uh, and in that session, we listen to what the academia, the Ministry of Education, um, also NGOs has to say around these topics. And well, Peru is a strong supporter of an open, free, safe and secure internet. And we as a country are advocating for policy settings that support this position. Um, so yes, in a, if I have to say a brief response, multi-stakeholder efforts are the best when trying to regulate uh, these emerging technologies. Uh, thank you so much and looking forward to listen to the other colleagues. Perfect. Thank you so much. It's, it's so nice to hear that in, in Peru, they already uh, actively do this. And, and I hope that many other countries take an example for this as well, if they're not doing so yet. Um, then I would like to go to uh, Rashi to share her point of view on uh, this question. Rashi, the floor Thanks, is yours. Stephanie. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I apologize. I might not be able to switch on my camera, but uh, I do. My connection's a bit patchy. But yeah, I'm happy to kind of share slides and uh, we uh, perhaps talk a little bit about the work that I've been doing with the Innovation for Policy Foundation in UN. We'll be looking at um, kind of um, case studies um, and, and use cases across the world on what are the effective multi-stakeholder approaches to AI policy development. So. Uh, maybe I could talk a little bit about how I think something that we've seen is that there's just a general uh, misconception around what AI can do and how AI can actually uh, be effective. Um, so we've realized that most of the AI policies, if they really have to kind of affect all stakeholders um, in it being related to jobs or or any other aspect, um, you really do need to have a lot of lit literacy and and I would say building capacity initiatives uh, across the sector. So maybe I'll go on to the next slide, please. Daphne, maybe you can share the next slide. Yes, I'm yeah, trying to so, do so, I'm having a bit of a fight with it. Yeah, you, Apologies. You've got it now. Perfect. No worries. Can, can it be seen? I'm, okay, I'm, I'm unfortunately unable to see all of them, but we've also seen that multi-stakeholder approaches uh, when done really well, of course, have to come in um, and initiated by the government. Um, they also ensure a consensus that you have to kind of reach to on why the final outcome is widely supported. So, uh, you know, have a good feedback mechanism loop and be in touch with the community rather than having one-off events. Um, 
uh, and also, like I said, participatory processes resume, raise a lot of awareness and build capacity. Uh, one of the great examples perhaps in India is that uh, post the India strategy, the India strategy was drafted by uh, the, a government think tank, think tank called Niti Aayog. But then once the drafting was done, it had a very multi-sectoral approach. We, had, uh, we have a non-profit foundation that's kind of furthering the development of the, of the health policy. Uh, and we have a for-profit entity that's looking the, where it started an initiative called AI for All, which is basically how do we incorporate um, AI education um, in schools uh, and universities. Um, Daphne, next slide, please, or maybe someone else could share them. I, I lost. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to share them in a different way because um, my laptop decided that it, it didn't want to work anymore. Give me one second. No worries. Um, Sorry for this. Yeah, I think, <laughs> no, no, that's okay. I, I can go on. Um, so yeah, I think the uh, basically uh, the, the multi-sectoral approach was really nice because all of the sectors could really play in with their strengths. Uh, because uh, obviously in this case, a lot of government entities don't have an idea of what the implications of AI are, and you really need technologists and people who really understand the issue. So it's also good to kind of borrow ideas, and and no country can really work on silos. I don't think a lot of countries can do that. So when when we wanted to understand and and build this uh, handbook to guide policymakers across the world, we did take expertise from from experts from across the world, and we also that 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 was one where we wanted to understand what are the human rights implications of AI. And in the second aspect, uh, we also wanted to take interesting case studies from across the world. So we spoke to Brazil, we spoke to uh, Chile, which is an, again, great example of a bottom-up approach process, where for the first time, they actually had citizens that, that participated um, and really enjoyed the process of learning throughout, along with a lot of civil society actors. Um, they recently published their AI strategy and sometime I think in last week of October. So yeah, um, our, our idea was to kind of provide evidence-based guidance on how you can have more policy co-creation efforts and, um, and also look at kind of, you know, how do, how do we impose a human rights, uh, human rights aspect of things? Because yeah, there's just a lot of hysteria around how AI will take away your jobs and a lot of other myths that we try to debuff. Um, if you can move on to the next slide. Uh, yeah, these are some of the testimonies that we had from experts across the world. So it says inclusion is not just the participation, but it's engagement, representation, and empowerment of disabled and un underrepresented groups and population. And this is important for anyone uh, who wants to, and especially for private sector who's looking at adoption, I mean, which is far, you know, far and wide. So uh, one, one great example, I would say, uh, which is, is the Common Voices project that looks, as, that looks at voice recognition, and they're doing some great work in Africa. Um, the next slide, please. Yeah, so also uh, AI is also very input driven. So you need to make sure that you train your data sets in languages outside English, because you have a lot of populations that don't speak in English and operate in, operate in different dialects across the world and how it's important to kind of consider any policy discussions to avoid biases, because I know that we're all, we're all human beings that have our own sets of biases, but kind of having more data sets um, could really inform um, and, and, train, and train your AI technology uh, to be as accurate as possible. Uh, next slide. But yeah, some of the downsides of multi-sectoral approach is that it is difficult to translate it to theory and practice can be really hard because it requires effort, time and resources, and more importantly, a high budget. Uh, because you know you're really looking at enabling the process from different actors, which takes a lot of time and strategy. Uh, and as we said, that countries really need to be more open to this process because it's hard to convince those who are in charge and ensure a very uh, inclusive process. So that's um, an aspect that where we say, I mean, yeah. So it really depends on who's kind of navigating through this. And maybe I'll. I'll end with talking about a few lessons that we've learned in the process and the conversations that we've had. Um, next slide, please. So some of the lessons learned, we say that assign clear responsibilities to all stakeholders, making sure that you're building capacity and awareness, especially among civil society, especially the ones who, who want to use AI, AI technology to kind of you know, solve, solve problems in their, in, in their line of work. Um, also, 
course, establishing a diverse and inclusive task force and expert group um, from preferably from across the world so that, you know, you can kind of weigh in and also learn new perspectives. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Uh, so yeah, um, also, when you're looking at a deliberative process, you're also trying to reach consensus, so it also requires discussion among the, uh, among different uh, stakeholders. Um, it is also also important for you to make sure that you do have disadvantaged groups um, and and always rather than a, a lot of issues that we do see is that a lot of countries like picking up policies that they find interesting, but not localizing them with existing examples. And I think that's very important to try and test everything. And of course, um, if, you, if you're looking at it from a long-term aspect, it's also important to have community champions uh, to effectively communicate, and in many cases, even translate um, translate whatever policies that we're trying to come up with. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, um, also determining a time and horizon strategy. India has a five-year strategy. Um, Chile, Chile finished their strategy in two years and, and will take perhaps another eight years for it to kind of move into legislation. Um, also, um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's more about it. And I'm happy to answer any questions that, that might be um, taken up. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. And I think this is a very in interesting insight to see uh, how I for policy is, is working with this. Uh, and I think during Q&A, we'll definitely discuss this even further. But before we go to the Q&A part, uh, we will first go to Veronica. Uh, please share your insights. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Daphne. Uh, I just wanted to compliment to what uh, Rahashi and Paula already said. And um, Rahashi rightly mentioned the multi-stakeholder uh, approach has been, you know, undertaken in India, and uh, the multi-stakeholder approach of uh, the uh, UNESCO recommendations on AI, uh, on the ethics of AI. And uh, my thought is uh, at this point that it's easy to reach the, you know, to convince uh, governments to get to the multi stakeholder approach when it comes to ethics. But it's a bit more difficult, difficult to convince them when it comes to complex regulation. Uh, like that the di digital market and competition because the main uh, argument against multi-stakeholderism um, is that first not all the stakeholders are um, you know interested in the multi-stakeholder in the policy making when it comes to digital market and competition and the second argument uh, that they raised is that uh, not all the, the stakeholders, for example, civil society have um, has the right uh, expertise to uh, cope with complex with the complexity of digital markets and uh, and competition. Um, both have been proven wrong. In the first case, um, the open consultation of both the new competition tools and the Digital Market Act have been, um, you know, we experienced uh, in the European Union a great participation, a great response by civil society, um, by the pri private sector. And I have the percentage here, and I have to say that, you know, uh, almost more than a half in when it, um, regarding the new competition tool, more than a half of the responses to the um, inception impact assessment came from a private sector. Then we have um, non-governmental organization and there were a small percentage of individual uh, European citizens that actually send their um, response to uh, the inception impact, impact assessment why the academics uh, percentage of participation percentage of participation is a bit disappointing because i see here like um, 8% 8% 
of uh, person representing academia uh, participated to the uh, open consultation about a new competition tool. And we have also other, um, you know, other percentage uh, on our um, data regarding the participation of uh, stakeholders to the open consultation uh, of the Digital Markets Act. And 66% of European citizens um, participated to the open consultation. So the first argument is, I mean, it's, it's been proven wrong, wrong. In the second case, mm, uh, we have also the experience of um, the Digital Market Act, the uh, compromise uh, draft. Um, in the compromise draft, the European Parliament has proposed the establishment of a high level group of um, um, uh, a high level group of uh, digital regulators that gathers together representative from um, the Commission and the national authorities, data protection authorities, telecommunication authorities, uh, competition authorities, all from public bodies, no one from the other stakeholders. And I think that this is um, this has this this has been a mischance to actually get the other stakeholder involved uh, into uh, into the regulatory or policy making process because this uh, group, a high level group uh, would be, uh, would carry out advisory uh, task to the commission um, pertaining to the activities uh, falling within the scope of the Digital Markets Act. So it would have been a good choice to open up uh, the participation to the other stakeholders at this point. And uh, yes, last consideration from my part is that, um, as I mentioned before, when Helios asked me a question, um, the antitrust law was designed when market for traditional markets. Um, now we live in a digital world. We have this mantra in this IGF and um, for, I mean, it's high time we recognize or acknowledge the fact that other stakeholders um, when it, or I mean, when it comes to the regulation of internet related, um, internet related regulations or internet related issues, at this point we have to bring multi stakeholders forward. Great, thank you so much for your insights. I, I think these were all great contributions that made our policy question much clearer but I am sure that there are still many questions as well. So Elliot, over to you. See, Nathan's got his hand up. Nathan, go ahead. There is Nathan here that wants the- Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm agree with you uh, about um, uh, the opening of, uh, uh, or to the participation of uh, uh, other stakeholders like uh, private sectors, uh, companies but uh, is to see that if you want to add this kind of stakeholders you have to consider small business because if the big companies uh, took part at this uh, 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 at this uh, i don't know how uh, took part at uh, this kind of uh, platform the problem will be stay the same because they are more powerful so we have to we permit at the small business to have a good, a big, uh, uh, a big, uh, I would say, to have a, a word to say, to listen to the small business because there is a small business which have, uh, we suffer by this anti-competitive practice. So we have to listen to these small businesses. Uh, we can give them the, the floor but we have to consider the, 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 what they say. I don't know if you, you understand. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I answer to 
just a quick reply to uh, Nathan. Um, in, the, in the EU, the digital market act, uh, sets a uh, top-down compliance on gatekeepers and compliance as costs, that costs that will pass on to their customers. There are small uh, businesses. So I think that the private sector, yes, or at least their customers, the small businesses should also be taken into consideration when it comes to co-regulation at this point. Sure, that's great. Question. Thanks for those contributions. Yes, I think we have a hand up in the crowd. Thank you. Okay, you sorted out the mic. Hi, I'm Vittorio Bertola. I'm, I work for a, a German open source software company, a mid-sized one uh, that's called Open Exchange. So actually, I, I did want to <coughs> enter into this discussion and, and actually provide a private sector perspective from European SMEs. Um, actually, we've been uh, busy building actually a coalition which is called the Coalition for Competitive Digital Markets, which is gathering uh, over 50 companies, even if we just exist um, I mean, since a couple of months from 16 countries and almost all of them are SMEs. And, and we are actually trying to participate in the European regulatory discussion. So I, I actually wanted to say, first of, of all, that Nathan's comment was uh, spot on. Actually, you, you do have this issue that from, from one point of view, you would like to get a more multi-stakeholder uh, participation processes. I mean, like the IGF, I, I've been involved in this for like 20 years. So I was one of the people that promoted the, in actually invented the IGF and promoted the idea of multi-stakeholder processes. So I'm all in favor of them. But the practical experience shows that over the internet, especially, many of the multi-stakeholder processes, be them conferences, be them, for example, the standardization bodies, are dominated by the same big tech companies that dominate the markets. So if you go and try to participate into these processes, maybe if you go to the global standardization processes like the ITF or the W3C, there's a different set of big companies than the ones you found in, find in European standardization venues like Etsy. Or, but at the same time, and these are typical places where uh, big companies have the money and the energies to send a lot of people, while small companies are very few. And they, they have a hard time because they, they have very few people and maybe they follow it, maybe they're subscribed to mailing lists, maybe they even go to the meetings and sit in the, in the last row of seats, but they never have the time to take leadership positions to do a lot of work. So in the end, the result is deeply shaped by the biggest companies. And, uh, and so we have to be very careful that whatever multi-stakeholder consultation processes or, or even deliberation processes are introduced around regulation are not so easy to capture by the biggest uh, people, the people that, that can throw more money and more resources to them. And uh, also more in general, I think that uh, for European SMEs, it's very important to finally start to see some regulation of digital markets. So we've been asking for this for quite some time uh, because the imbalance in European digital markets is, uh, is evident. And the fact that we now have network effects so that it's very hard to compete, even if you have good products, sometimes better products than the dominant ones, it's, it's clear. So in the end, uh, uh, I, I, I would say that especially the Digital Markets Act does a good job in distinguishing between the, the big gatekeeper companies, which have the obligations, and the small uh, business companies, which are protected. I mean, they are given opportunities for competition simply by the fact that, for example, the gatekeepers uh, sh should be forced to open up their, their uh, services to interoperability. And they are also given guarantees if they are customers or users of, of these big platforms, which is also very important because the imbalance of power in, in the business negotiation between Amazon and an Amazon supplier or a third party that wants to sell stuff on Amazon is clear and it, and it is huge. And so there is the need to protect these people with uh, even the business terms and the terms and conditions of, of these services should be, if not fully regulated, at least uh, uh, should have oversight by public regulators, because it's just too easy for the big platform to impose both to business users and to end users 
that their own conditions, which, which often are not balanced and not fair. Uh, at the same time, I do recognize, I mean, it's true, as we were saying before, that there are other cases of regulation in which the, the, the lawmaker is thinking of uh, obligations that are only possible for the very big companies, but are not really possible for the SMEs. So if you have to take down content in 12 hours, uh, if you're a very big company, you can have people that spend all their time in, in terms uh, in front of a computer and moderate content. If you're a three people company with a new community of social media, it's basically impossible to do that. So it's going to kill your business. So we have to be very careful that, uh, I mean, to tell and explain to lawmakers that they have to make differences in these things. We, we have been sometimes successful. I mean, the, the copyright directive the, uh, recent experience has been, I mean, good and bad. There, there, there are some really bad things about upload filters, but for example, we could get an exemption for open source code sharing platforms from the upload filters. This was obtained only because there was some active participation by the directly affected companies. And so we, we need to, maybe what we should do is also to mobilize more all the small business companies around the world and to participate in these lawmaking processes. So sorry if in the end this was more of a comment than a question, but maybe there's some reflection that the people want to, to make on, on this. Thank you, I think that's really valuable. Um, anyone wish to comment on that? Maybe also uh, good to link it maybe with another question because uh, we're we're talking about uh, in the, in the great intervention we were talking about well the, it's actually really difficult for for small and, and medium sized enterprises to like kind of stand up uh, and compete with with the bigger companies especially when it comes to um, policy making uh, processes and and to have your say and your input in that. And uh, it was also shortly touched upon that it might actually need to be a worldwide effort to stand up against these big global companies. And I think maybe a question we can link to that is, do we think that there is a need uh, for worldwide regulations or, or standards, uh, especially because there are companies with a global reach uh, because we have cross-border data transfers. So we see that the digital mar the market is not regional anymore, but it's a global thing. So do we think there there is a need for, for worldwide regulation? And maybe uh, Nathan or, or Rashi would like to say something about that. I'm not, uh, this is actually just said, I'm not sure if we first need to have, I think, a commonly um, accepted definition of what we perhaps define regulation. It depends on which uh, emerging technology you are specifically talking about. So I think we, we lack a commonly accepted, or rather I would say taxonomy. So I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to work because you have some countries that have different legislation and some countries like I think in India, I, I do feel that there is a huge enforcement issue. So I'm, I'm not sure if the balance is going to be there. It needs to be more country specific, uh, but yeah, there, there still might be room for a more for more international cooperation, but I'm not sure on how many aspects. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm gonna hand it over to a lawyer who might be able to provide more uh, a more detailed answer to this. Nathan or Veronica, would one of you like to uh, give your point of view on this? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I was uh, thinking that Vittorio just showed that um, there are perspective points of view that are not taken into consideration from other stakeholders. For example, I could never have imagined that there are some issue that relates, uh, that concern directly um, the private sector they are working on uh, in a coalition in this sense. And uh, I think that also the multi-stakeholder approach really apply to this. And uh, I first mentioned the high level group on, um, on uh, regulatory, on regulation digital markets that is being 
uh, embraced uh, or included within the Digital Markets Act, uh, that group is an advisory group. It's not um, a core, um, it, it's not like, um, doesn't uh, concern uh, core regulation in that sense, but it's an advisory group that uh, has certain tasks uh, to advise the commission um, per in, per in some um, area uh, falling within the scope of digi the Digital Markets Act. And this is a step forward, in my opinion. It's not like including the multi-stakeholder approach in the lawmaking process, but, you know, we are stepping up or we should at least. Um, maybe a, a question for Nathan. Um, I know you, you mentioned the European and the Japanese examples as um, regulations in this digital space. Are there any um, em countries like emerging economies which are doing, in your mind, a good job at regulating the digital economies? Elliot, can you repeat your question? I didn't get it. Um, can you, in your mind, what are some of the best emerging economies dealing with digital competition? Like, uh, are there any countries that are doing a good job at passing this from the emerging economies? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... As I told uh, uh, in the, according the anti-competitive uh, uh, practice, we have uh, the main problem everywhere. Even if in Africa, we have the same problem. You know that in Africa, uh, digital markets are not so developed. So we use European and uh, uh, Occidental, uh, Chinese, uh, American platforms. We, we still use it uh, more than our own platform. So it's still the same problem. The local company have the same problem because uh, they are not powerful to fight or to have a good concurrence against, with, uh, against these big companies. And uh, if we take the, the case of uh, uh, companies, big companies uh, still uh, try to buy the small ones, that is a problem. And we can take another case where big uh, uh, digital companies uh, uh, create regulations to 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 to, to to make uh, the, the, the small one have a good business online. So if we take the problem of marketplace, it's the same problem. On marketplace, the big companies are um, very good visibility than uh, small ones. If you don't have money, if you are on the same marketplace, uh, your visibility is very, very, very small. We don't see you. We only see companies who have a big capacity to, to pay it for uh, publicities, to pay for spaces and uh, other things. That is the same. So online or offline, the problem is still here. So we have to adapt the rules and policies offline in on online. And I think that the, the internet must be uh, a solution to resolve this kind of anti-competitive anti uh, issues, uh, practice. Uh, it's uh, now to uh, redistrib uh, to to uh, to equalize all things. I think that the uh, this kind of ev event, IGF, we have to create 
uh, this uh, stakeholder, multi-stakeholders uh, platform to hear and to consider what small companies uh, have as problem. So that is my point of view according is in Africa it's the same, but we, we, we the small company are very problem than small company in European and China because we use a lot of um, digital business uh, come from occidental uh, area. Elder, take it away. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, even though I am the rapporteur of this session and my job is to write down things, but I like this dis discussion made me think about more about the things that's raised by the speakers and also the audience. And I want to uh, ask actually uh, Veronica because I feel she's more, she's closer to the European Union perspective because I, uh, from the discussions, I understood that it may be the case that the Digital Markets Act, or for example, the another and other regulations in the other parts of the world, they are not really reflecting the viewpoint of the small and medium-sized companies, uh, as the the audience also raised this concern. And is it possible, for example, to challenge these regulations? after they are adapted, uh, for example, in the European Union, is, has there been any cases at the level of European Court of Justice or to uh, by the small and medium sized companies to, yeah, to challenge the regulation itself, even though they are not involved in the, let's say the drafting process, maybe they can enforce their rights or maybe they can have to lobby against these regulations in other institutions like the courts. Is it possible at least, if, even if there is no case, is it possible to do that? Or do you think, do you see any hopes? Thank you. Can I answer to that? It's true, uh, sure. Yes, the Digital Market Act actually uh, for is a, a, you know, um, the revising process uh, of, especially of the uh, self-executing, uh, you know, uh, there is a list or the, the, like kind of black lists or, um, of uh, activity that should be uh, self-executing. And it's specifically for Zin a process to update that list. Uh, I'm not sure that um, I answered your question because you were talking about challenging the regulation, but I think that the European Commission uh, was thinking to um, to make the digital the, the the DMA regulation as flexible as possible because we acknowledge the fact that digital markets are you know um, you are you are fast evolving markets so it's not possible to foresee now in this moment uh, in you know in 2020 2021 uh, all the hypotheses. Uh, so yes, they are, um, you know, you are considering to implement, the, um, to adapt the DMA uh, over the time, over time. Nathan, please go ahead. Okay, I want to add something about the uh, annual question. I know that uh, if small business and want to challenge uh, uh, big ones, uh, they have to 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 denounce uh, all anti um, corruption, anti competitive uh, practice. One to denounce already denounce. And I know I see that if they want to won this war because I it's a war, it's a it's a war. If small business want to want won this war, they have to create a, a own federation 
like social so, uh, social uh, uh, society civil civil society uh, groupments and fight against uh, these practices so if they put themselves in the group if they create uh, associations uh, to fight i would think that the the problem will be have uh, a solution because if everyone want to fight uh, alone it's gonna be good it's gonna be a big problem don't be uh, the fight will be lost i don't know if you understand thank you i think that's a great addition and i think if there are no further um comments from either the speakers or the public i think it's a great point to take a look at the key takeaways that we had during the session so first of all uh, my final question will be are there any final points that people would like to bring forward and i think then uh, i can go to the key uh, takeaways that we noticed during the session and there are basically six points uh, of which we think became very clear and that are um, points where we should take further action on and maybe who knows for a session for next year uh, to find solutions for issues that we have identified during the session. And the first point is that it is not easy to come up with the best model for the regulation of uh, digital markets. Governments may consider alternatives like constant monitoring and assessment of digital markets instead of quick regulation with hard law. So we really notice that hard law uh, is not the way to go uh, in all cases and that the pieces of monitoring um, also more multi-stakeholder uh, consultations and points like that are actually much more effective uh, to create regulations maybe in the form of soft law um, and to kind of take action whenever it's necessary instead of going through a full regulatory uh, process. And the second point is, uh, in addition to emerging regulations, the government should not ignore the fact that local entrepreneurs are not often at the same level as big tech companies to comply with those regulations. That's why the government should not always rush in the regulation. And I think this was very uh, well illustrator, uh, illustrated with our, our, our basically guest speaker to say, uh, from the public who represented the point of view from um, the private sector and especially as being a small uh, and medium sized enterprise, so it's very difficult to compete with uh, big tech companies uh, when it comes to having influence on, on emerging regulations. And I think that is something that we might have to set up a session for next year, because I think that's a very interesting and, and specific point of view uh, that we should definitely pay more attention to as well, because that's often overlooked. So I think it's great it was identified during the session. And then in the in the third point of view, which also very strongly links together with the second one, is that in terms of the regulations in the field of mergers and acquisitions, for example, the criteria to call a certain acquisition anti-competitive are not sufficiently effective to predict long-term impacts. And the criteria must be developed to be able to consider future impacts of the regulations as well. And there we notice that it's very much a focus on what's happening right now and maybe what's happening in the next few months. But as we see a lot, digital markets transform much faster than um, like our regular normal markets, which the regulators have been used to for years. So I think it's an incredibly important point of view to also um, take a look at the further future and also to keep in mind that these developments in the digital markets take place much faster and, and much more unexpectedly than it does in the in our, our real life market to say like that. And I think Veronica very well pointed that out during her first speech as well. Um, and the fourth point is, uh, despite the drawbacks of the multi-stakeholder approach, especially budget concerns, this approach is not only working well in practice, but also implemented in the practice of Latin American countries and India to produce better regulations for emerging digital markets. And I think we heard that very well from uh, both Paola and Rashi, who gave great examples of how the multi-stakeholder approach 
uh, was very useful in the case of, of making regulations in those countries and where they very actively try to find a point of view from different stakeholders uh, in a way that it, it could be um, could have like a proper impact on, on the regulation. So I, I think that's a very good example and, and that those two countries definitely set an example for other countries as well. And I think, especially for the European Union. Um, and coming from the example of the European Union, uh, the multi-stakeholder approach must be improved to be more inclusive with the part participation of the academia. And I think, we saw it very well from Veronica, who is a speaker from academia, who had great ideas uh, that those voices definitely need to be heard as well when we take into account the multi-stakeholder approach. So I think there we come up with, with the point that um, not only we need to look more at small, medium-sized enterprises, but also at academia and the research that's taking place there um, in order to have a, a full and, and very effective multi-stakeholder approach where uh, we can also better look at, at the future impacts and the impacts for smaller companies. And then the last point, uh, which is very important, is that there seems to be different approaches to the multi-stakeholder approach, both when you compare uh, Latin American countries and, and India on one side, where it's generally positive and very impactful, and the EU on the other side, which is accompanied, accompanied by initiative concerns, as we also saw in the interventions uh, by our speakers and from the public. And um, the multi-stakeholder approach may sometimes result in compromising the small and medium-sized companies, even though the uh, private sector is represented by big tech companies. So this is a point that we have seen a few times during this session and uh, that I also pointed out a, a few times during this, the discussion of the key takeaways, um, that there is very much a need to have more of a focus on um, small and medium-sized enterprise because the private company is not only Apple and Facebook and Microsoft and all those companies, but also the small companies who come up with great solutions and great ideas who we should definitely listen to. And I think maybe uh, a, a, an idea for next year is to, on one hand, look how can regulations be more future-proof and on the other hand, also look at how can we involve, for example, academia, but also small and medium enterprises better in the multi-stakeholder model. And maybe how can we improve the multi-stakeholder model further? And I think that's a, a great point of discussion for after this session and, and hopefully at the IGF next year. So with five minutes to spare, uh, I would say thank you so much. And I would very much like to hear if there are any concluding remarks from the speakers or from uh, the audience and uh, I wish you all a, a great ITF and a great day. Um, I just wanted to thank you um, since we have a few minutes, few minutes left. Uh, I want to thank you Daphne, Elliot and Elnur uh, for organizing this session, pointing out that uh, this, is been, this has been organized by uh, a youth, one of the youth uh, with the youth initiative. So uh, it's very well, well welcome this opportunity uh, to speak up uh, in this, uh, you know, platform. Thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Elnu to uh, inviting me at this session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Daphne. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, after this session, I will launch the new version of my website in this room. I invited some friends here. So if we end now with this session, uh, my company is a digital uh, agency in Burkina Faso called it DigiClink. And we are going to launch a new version of website uh, here in EJF. It's an honor for me. Uh, so. I will launch it in a few minutes. <laughs> that was great. Okay. Congratulations on that launch. And I also very much want to thank our, our wonderful speakers, uh, Paola, who unfortunately is not uh, with us anymore, but also Veronica and Nathan and Rashi for their great contributions. And also uh, thank you, Elliot and Elmer, for uh, 
co-organizing this and 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 helping in such a great way and, and coming up with all the solutions i had an absolute blast and i really enjoyed it and uh, it gave me a lot to think about again so thank you all so much Okay, Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. I really enjoyed and hope everyone has a good idea. Yeah. Thank you, Rashi. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.